Okay, so today I want to preach a message that actually I had preached back in 2018. How many of you remember the year 2018? It's been a while, right? Especially 2020 was such a long year that many of us have forgotten what years prior were like. Um, I want to preach a message that I preached back in 2018, and it's a message that actually is my mom's favorite of my messages that I preached back in 2018, even though she probably doesn't even know what the name of it is. Um, But it's one that has impacted me, and I'd like to share it with you because as I've grown, I think this message is going to still be relevant, and it's it's matured as I have matured in my own life. Uh, So if you could turn your Bibles to 2 Kings chapter 5, if you got your Bible Apple with you. Uh, for some reason, our, our screen isn't uh, cooperating with us today, but 2 Kings chapter 5, 2 Kings chapter 5. As you're getting there, I want to sing us a song, and it goes like this. I keep falling in love with him over and over and over and over again. I keep falling in love with him over and over and over and over again. He is sweeter and sweeter as the days go by. Oh, what a love between my Lord and I. I keep falling in love with Him over and over and over and over again. Oh, till o fa ya te ya ya so uma ya so ya so uma ma tai mi uma. O te alofa ya te ya ya so uma ya so uma matai mi uma o me a uma walele itau sanga uma o lo o fa atasi mai be aleta ma o te alofa ya te ya ya so so uma ya so uma matai mi uma. Amen. You there? You there, you there, you there? Okay. Second Kings chapter 5, verses 1 through 14. I'm going to be skipping a couple verses here and there by paraphrasing, but I want to intro our, uh, our title for this message today with a story. So when I was a kid, especially during the summertime, Jared and Jaden and Asher, Asher's here, but Jared and Jaden aren't. When I was around their age, we used to have sleepovers at everyone's house. Justin knows, Henry knows, we would sleep over at each other's house, especially during the summertime. And what we would do is we would rotate. So one week I would sleep over, everyone would sleep over at my house. One week it would be at Justin's house. Another week it would be at Julius's house. And we would rotate our sleepovers, right? So if, it, if we got like tired of hanging out at my house for a super long time, we'll go to somebody else's house. But we kind of all stayed in a pack the entire summer and we spent very rarely any time home alone with our actual family we were spending time with our 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 cousins and stuff and so um what we would used to do is we would rotate in garages we would sleep in somebody's garage we would sleep in julius's garage we slept in my garage which was always cold at night for whatever reason uh sometimes we would sleep uh all on henry's uh, apartment floor right in the middle um or we would go in justin's room and all kind of huddle in there together some of us would sleep on the bed some of us would sleep on the ground and there was always uh, quite a few of us and uh one time it was at julius's house and uh we were all getting prepared and we would all bring blankets and pillows and we would put them on the ground, especially if we were in a garage. There would be a couple couches in there. We would put all of our uh, blankets on the ground and our pillows and we would claim spots. So we all kind of huddled together. So somebody would sleep right here, somebody would sleep right there and we'd all kind of huddle together. Now, one of my cousins who shall remain nameless and I will not, I promise not to mention his name. He um, had, had put his blanket and his pillow right in the middle. So we were getting ready to go to bed, and um, he went to go use the bathroom. And as he goes to use the bathroom, one, uh, one of the other guys who he said he called that spot took the blanket, put it on the outside, grabbed his pillow, put it on the outside, and put his stuff in the middle. And so this cousin comes back inside, and he's like, who moved my blanket? And we're looking at him like, what, what are you talking about? And he goes, somebody moved my blanket. And we're like, oh, no, uh, he claimed your spot. And he goes, no, that's my spot. And you can see he's starting to, like, panic. He's panicking. And we're like, why are you, like, what's wrong? And you can see, no, no, I can't, I can't, I can't, I can't. No, 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 don't do this, don't do this. Oh, I can't sleep, I can't sleep on the edge. And I was like, what's your problem? And he goes, I have a phobia. He said, I have a phobia, a fear of, of being on the edge. Like, I can't be on the edge of boats. I can't be on the edge of cliffs. I can't be on the edge of anything. I can't even be on the edge of my seat. And we're like, what is wrong with you? And he goes, guys, I can't do it because I've got a condition. And so today I want to preach to you a message. I want you to turn to a couple people around them, around you and say, I've got a condition. 
I've got a condition. Now, for the purpose of this message, I went and did a little bit of research about a phobia of being on the edge, and it doesn't exist. I was just playing with you. I thought you guys are going to be like, what is he going to say? What kind, what's the phobia called? It doesn't exist. This is one, my cousin is the one and only that I've ever known. There are, uh, the reason why I'm bringing this up is because I believe that there are two kinds of conditions that we have as individuals. And for those of you who are at Bible study last night, you, you, you have heard this before. There are two kinds of conditions. There are your external conditions, the things that people can see, what you're wearing, what shoes you're wearing, how you stand tall, how, people, how you smell, right? The way that people perceive you, that's an external condition. But then there's also, in contrary to that, internal conditions, the way that you view yourself, your self-worth, the way that you um, uh, act towards situations, the inside, how you process things, there are your external and internal conditions, right? And they're really important to understand. And I want to talk about that today because we live in a world that's infatuated with your external condition, right? How you look, how you're perceived, how your Instagram filters make you look, right? Wearing makeup to cover you up. I just got a haircut today, getting a haircut so that people uh, notice you, making sure you put on the, the nicest deodorant, the coolest uh, perfume or uh, cologne so that people, they recognize, right? What you smell like, what you look like, all that stuff, right? The world loves the external conditions. But in contrary... God is not interested in how you look, how you smell, how tall you walk, whether you can walk or you cannot walk. God is not interested in things. In 1 Samuel chapter 16, verse 7, it says that God does not see as man sees, for man looks at the outward, external appearance, but God looks at the condition of your heart, what's on the inside inside. And so today, this passage in 2 Kings chapter 5, verses uh, 9 through 14 specifically, but I want to go 1 through 14, it tells us about the importance of our internal conditions. Because the reality of the matter is that we are all going to change on the outward. But the importance is, as, as we change on the outward, does our changes on the inside be for good or bad? Or, or are we being better as we change on the inside? And 2 Kings chapter 5, verses 1 through 19 is a great character study at the differences between the external and the, inter, the internal conditions, right? Because the reality is, you can be rich and have money, that's external, but still be miserable on the inside. And on the contrary, you can not have any money at all and be the happiest person in the world. You can have a job and wish you were jobless and not have a job and be longing for a job, right? There are our external and internal conditions. And, and I want us as Christians to get to the point where Paul got to in, in Philippians chapter 4, verse 11, where he says, I am content with whatever circumstance comes my way. So the inside is what? contentment. But the outside is, I could be in prison. I could be stoned uh, by individuals who are trying to kill me. I could be spat at. I could be laughed at. But on the inside, I'm still content. Do we all want to get to the place where we're content regardless of whatever circumstances happen in the external? They don't change what happens on the internal. And 2 Kings chapter uh, 5 gives us a blueprint on as to how we can maintain sanity and maintain peace in the midst of chaos and turmoil. I want to ask you all today, who, how many of you would like to get your PhD today? You guys are all uh, resident and, and doc, uh, resident doctors for the day. Can we all be resident doctors for the day? I'm going to need your help, right? I'm going to need your help to be doctors. And there are two things that doctors do. They try to prescribe or find ways to fix your condition. But the first thing that they'd have to do is diagnose your condition, right? And so today I want us to do a character study on four people. And I want you to help me. This is a collaborative effort. I want you all to help me as we do this character study. And I want you to help me diagnose these four individuals. Let's start with the first character. You got your Bible on you, 2 Kings chapter 5. Let's turn to it right now. It says, Now Naaman was a commander of the army of the king of Aram. He was a great man in the sight of his master and highly regarded because through him the Lord had given victory to Aram. He was a valiant soldier. Pause. Now, 
Check this out. Naaman is, back in, when this particular passage is written, comes from Aram, or Syria, which is the country that is just north of Israel. So Israel's right here, and they had constantly been at war. And it says that God had given Naaman victory in all of his conquests. So he's very well known. He's very popular. He's a very... Highly regarded. Look, it says Naaman was a commander, so we know that he's respected first. We see that uh, he's a great man in the sight of his masters. He's highly regarded. He's a decorated war hero, and the Lord had given him victory, which means that he's favored. So on the, on the external, what does it look like? It looks like things are going great. It looks like he's respected. People love him. People look up to him. People, uh, if he's walking by, they tip their cap to him because people love this man, right? He's loved and people care about what he thinks. But check this out. It says in verse 1 at the end, but, now if you see the word but, B-U-T, not two T's, one T in the Bible, you got to pay attention to it because there's something that you're about to find out. It says, but, I heard a preacher say that's the biggest word in the Bible. He had leprosy. He had a problem. So externally, people perceive that everything's good. He's well known. He's famous. He got clout. But how many of you know that you can be perceived as having everything doing well on the outside, but on the inside feel like an utter failure? That's what this guy was feeling like because he had something that could have threatened to ruin his entire life because leprosy was a disease that at the time, if you had leprosy, especially if you were in Israel, they used to put you in the Q word that I didn't really know what it meant until last year. Does anybody know what the Q word is? Quarantine. They put him in, they would have had to put him, if he was Israelite, in quarantine. Now, this isn't just a quarantine that as a result of COVID, you just, oh, I'm just going to stay home and lock myself in my room for 10 days. No, you were outcasted in society and you could not come back if you were quarantined, if you were isolated because he had leprosy, the skin disease. Now, leprosy, modern day, we call it Crohn's disease. It's basically a disease where your flesh starts to eat itself. It's a really disgusting and nasty and painful disease. But because Back in those days, they didn't really have a great understanding of dermatology. If you had like a bunch of spots on your skin or you had freckles that were out of control or you had eczema, which is common in our poly community, or if you had severe acne, you could find yourself in quarantine. And so Naaman, check this out, this was a high stakes condition because outside everybody thinks everything is great, but Naaman is probably hiding the fact that there is something really wrong. Because if if Naaman loses his spot, then his family can't eat, right? Then he loses all of his position in terms of his military rank. And if he's isolated from his family, that means he could never get a chance to see his kids again. So internally, He's feeling desperate. Internally, he may be feeling hopeless. Internally, he may be feeling helpless. So, so my doctors, come and help me out. Externally, what's going on? Things, things are going well. He's well regarded. He's a highly decorated war veteran. People care about what he says. If he tells somebody what to do, they do it because he's a person of militaristic authority. But on the inside, what's happening? He's struggling. He's, he feels helpless. He feels hopeless. Now, I want to ask you this question. How many of you in your life feel like everything is going right 100% of the time? I heard somebody laugh. And, and, and how many of you think that everything in your life is a failure 100% of the time? You should probably laugh to that one too. Because in our lives, there are places where we're both doing great, but also places in our life where we're struggling. There's places in our life where we're thriving and also places in our life where we wish they were a little bit better. And that's where Naaman is. He feels hopeless because everything that he knows could be taken away. The reason why I keep harking on this is because this is a high stakes situation. I want you to put yourself in Naaman's shoes. Like if people find out that I have leprosy, I'm done. My family can't eat. I can't see my kids anymore. This is it for me. That's character number one. You guys did a good job of diagnosing character number one with your nods and your suggestions and all that stuff. Let's go to character number two. It says, let's go to verse number two. Now bands of raiders from Aram had gone out and had taken a young girl captive from Israel, and she served Naaman's wife. Pause. 
So there, we were introduced to a, a servant girl. Now notice, it says that she was taken from her homeland and she is a young girl. Externally, let's look at her resume. She is a slave. She is a girl. And she's a foreigner. A slave, a girl, and foreigner. Now, if you were a slave, a foreigner, and a girl who was taken away from her family by the enemy and is now serving a master who may be mistreating her, I don't know, who, who, who's in a foreign land that she's not familiar with and had to change her whole way of living, had to um, live where they, they worship a different God, everything has changed for this woman. My question to you is, my fellow doctors, how would you feel on the inside? Sad? Bitter? Depressed, upset, angry, not cooperative. That, I mean, you got, that's how I would feel. Somebody took me away from my mom and dad, took me away from my family, took me away from my church, and I was a girl and I was a servant. I would be upset. It's natural to feel bitter over something like that, right? But I want you to notice, Naaman is miserable and he has everything. And I want you to check out this girl, verse 3. Who's reading with me? It says, she said to her mistress, if only my master would see a prophet who is in Samaria, he would cure him of his leprosy. Well, rather than being upset or bitter, look what she says. If only my master knew somebody who could change his whole life. And I love that because she could have very easily been bitter and upset and be like, I know the secret sauce to let you get healing, but I'm not going to give it to you unless you set me free. She could have done, she could have done that. She could have wagered with them and said, uh, I know somebody, but I'm going to put a condition on the way that you can receive your blessing, on the way that you can receive your healing. She could have very easily said that, but she said no. How can I help? So what does that tell us about this girl? It tells us that in spite of her condition, in spite of all that she went through, she was still conditioned helpful. She had what we call in churches a servant's heart. Now, how does somebody who has been through so much still say, blessed be the name of the Lord? How does somebody who has lost everything Say, I'm going to help the person who took me from my family. How does somebody get to that point? That's the big question. How does somebody get to that point? But notice, we remember this girl, and all she said is one thing. I know a guy. That's all she said. I know somebody. And I love that she said that she knew somebody because, like, it was Naaman's breakthrough, and it was all because we're talking about this girl's impact at least 3,000 years after she said one line. We don't even get this girl's name, but because of what she said, we remember her. And I, I, I'm, I'm, I am, I would say that the reason why she was able to say what she said was because she knew God in her heart. Because if she didn't know God, it would be easy for her to be bitter. Yeah, they may have treated her nice, but she still doesn't know where her family is. But she had something on the inside. There was an internal condition that this girl had that I hope we all have. That, that yes, I maybe have deprived of something that I love in my life, some of the things that I wish would not have been taken away from me, but in spite of whatever happens to me, I am still saying, how can I be a good person, a person that we call has integrity? And it could have only come from God because it couldn't have come from them. They didn't, they, we don't, she was taken from her family and taken captive, but we see that this woman's, this girl's, condition was somebody who wanted to help. And you know, the best help that you may be to somebody is just telling them about what you know. You know, I don't know much. Uh, sometimes I, I get too big for my head and I think I know more than I do, but I don't know much. I know a couple of scriptures. I know how to do a couple of things. I don't know much. But there are some people that I know that I promise can change your life. There is a God that I know 
that I promise can change your life. And that's all she said. I just know somebody that can change your life. And that's from an internal condition. Externally, she could have been angry and bitter and upset. But on the inside, she said, how can I be useful? All right. Thanks, doctors. So Naaman gets this from the girl who says one line, and she, gets, she decides to help him out. And, and Naaman's like, all right, I'll take whatever I can get. He's desperate at this point. And so he goes to the king of Aram and asks the king of Aram to write a letter to the king of Israel, right? And that to say that he's coming to Israel to speak to this prophet, this person who could help him out. The king of Aram writes a letter to the king of Israel and says, hey, my servant Naaman's coming. I know we used to be war enemies, but I'm, he's coming out. So Naaman comes to, or has the letter written, and it reaches the king of Israel. Now, the king of Israel, let's diagnose his external condition. Now, he's a king. He has wealth. He has prestige. When he says something, it goes. Very similar to Naaman, right? He has everything. Everyone knows the king, right? How many of you know who the attorney general is of the United States of America? None of us. That's Naaman's position. But how many of y'all know the president of the United States? Exactly my point. So the king of Israel was more well known than Naaman. And I want you to notice, he has everything. He has whatever he could possibly want. But whenever, when the letter was written from the king of Aram, I want you to see his response. This is verse 8, or verse 6. Uh, verse 7, sorry. It says, as soon as the king of Israel read the letter... What does he do? It says he tore his robes and it says, Am I God? Can I kill and bring back to life? Why does this fellow send someone to, to be cured of his leprosy? See how he's trying to pick a quarrel with me? And he starts, he starts freaking out. How does a guy that has everything start freaking out? Conditionally on the outside, he has everything. He has money, well, status, power. Everybody knows his name. But he is freaking out on the inside. Why? Because he's scared, because he's fearful. He has money, but he's still scared. I heard a preacher say one time that money is an amplifier of your character. So if you were not happy before you had money, when you get money, it's not going to make you happy. If you were content before you had money, when you get money, you're still going to remain content. If you, had, if you had everything and you were angry before, it's only going to amplify that, those things which you already have. And the king had everything, and he's like, I'm freaking out. I don't, I don't know. I don't know. What, what, what do I do? Because he didn't have the discernment of God in his life. He didn't have that person to sit him down and tell him, God, this is an opportunity for God to, to use our kingdom and use this, this platform for us to be able to minister to the country north of us. And so we go to character number four. So character number one is naming character number two is, um, is the, the servant girl, character number three, is the king, and character number four is Elisha. Now, before I get into Elisha's story, Elisha did not have much money. I want you to notice the connection between people who have money in this story and people who don't have much, all right? So, so Elisha was a person, who, as scripture goes on, he starts, he has, um, he has people open up their homes for him to stay in. He's not a person who's very wealthy. He goes from place to place, kind of scavenges the land and, and eats whatever he has the opportunity to eat because he doesn't have much money. But it says that when Elisha, verse 8, heard that the man of God, or uh, the man of God heard that the king of Israel had torn his robes, he sent to him this message. Why have you torn your robes? Have the man come to me, and he will know that there is a prophet in Israel. So Elisha's response is like, as we put it nowadays, why are you tripping? Why are you consumed with all of these things that are happening? You see, because Elisha's like, I know that God can work through this situation. So bring him my way, and this is our opportunity. How many of us are always looking for opportunities to be used by God? I hope so. Because a lot, sometimes in my life, I will admit that I'm not looking for opportunities to be used by God. But Elisha sought out opportunities to be used by God. And that's my encouragement to you, to seek out opportunities to be used by God. And I love this principle of perspective, right? 
There was a story about uh, four people in the east that went to a tent that there was an elephant in. The this, this circus came to town and the elephant was in. One person came in and, and came out and said, I felt along what seems like a trunk and it was very smooth. And somebody went and, and said, I felt really big, gigantic things that look like a tree trunk. And then another person went in and said, I felt hair that was very thick and very coarse. And another person went in and said that I felt uh, these things that felt long and hard, kind of like a tusk that's on a rhino. All of them saw the same animal, but had a different perspective as to what it is. And my question to you is, what is your perspective when trials come your way? Is it like... Uh, the Israelites who went into Canaan and saw the giants and said, there's no way we're going to beat them. They look way too big. Or are you going to be the person like Job who lost everything and said, "Uh, though he slay me, yet will I trust him. The Lord giveth and the Lord taketh away. Blessed be the name of the Lord. It's the principle of perspective. And Elisha saw it way different internally than the king saw it. Notice that externally it's the same thing. It's the letter. But internally, one of them looked at it and was like, they're trying to pick a fight with us. The other one said, no, this is a miracle. One of them looked at this situation as a plot of war. Another one saw this as an opportunity for evangelism. One person saw it as a war mission. Another person saw it as a missionary visit. One saw it as a medical emergency. And one other person saw it as a miracle. How do you see it? See, Paul saw prison as a praise party. Daniel saw the lion's den as something that could be as silent as a library. Jesus saw Lazarus' tomb as an opportunity to testify as to the power that he had. The Israelites saw Goliath, and they said, he's too big to hit. And David looked at Goliath and said, that guy's way too big to miss. It's the principle of perspective. How do you see the trials that come your way? Do you see it from a lens of fear Or do you see it from a lens of the other F word, faith? Do I look at my trials and say, yeah, that's tough. I'm just going to tuck my tail between my legs and I'm going to go home and sit down and uh, have myself some water and cry as I go to bed. Or am I going to look at a situation and say, God is going to get glory by whatever situation that I face in my life. It's the principle of how you see it. How do you see it? Elisha saw the external condition of that letter as some way by which the people up north have an opportunity to see God for the first time in their lives. And if we all looked at situations and trials that we face as an opportunity for us to see God, open the eyes of my heart, wouldn't that change a lot of our lives is in, in terms of how we see things? The principle of perspective. And so Naaman gets the call to go to uh, the prophet Elisha's house, and he goes, right? And um, he, gets, he gets to the house, and he brings this huge entourage with him. All the, he got the whole crew coming in, and this is Naaman. This is a guy who, at his word, everything goes exactly how he says it would go. So he goes, and he's riding in his chariot, and I like to think that the Rocky theme music is playing. He's coming in with his chariot, riding on the horse. He goes to the door, and as soon as he gets to the door, they stop the chariot, and I bet the guys come in. The guys come in, and they knock on the door. Naaman, master general of the, the kingdom of Syria, has come to this door. Open up, and check this out. If you're reading your Bible, it says in verse, number, in verse number nine, he shows up and he knocks on Elisha's door. And what do you think Elisha would do? I think he would answer the door and be like, Naaman, come into my house. Come into my house. Uh, have some food. I'm going to heal you real quick. But it says that Naaman goes to the door. They knock on the door. Naaman, master attorney general of Syria is here. And he goes there and he goes there and they knock on the door. And guess this, check this out. Who answers the door? Not Elisha, but it says that Elisha's servant Gehazi opens the door. Now, Elisha doesn't even come to the door. He goes and he he stays in his house and Gehazi comes outside. And as Gehazi comes outside, he goes up to Naaman's. Hey, uh, my boy Elisha came and he told me to tell you that uh, you need to go to the river and wash yourself 
seven times. The Jordan River, right? And so he tells him to go to the Jordan River. This is verse 9, Georgie, since you're on it. Or verse 10. So he goes to the, he, 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 he sees it one way, but it happens a totally opposite way. How many of you in your life have ever experienced something that you expected to go one way, but went an entirely other way? How many of you expected 2020 was going to be, this is my year. Everything's going to go great. When the fireworks hit off on January 1st, 2020, all of us, I mean, at least me, was like, this is my year. I'm going to rock it this year. I'm going to kill it this year. And by the end, by the middle of 2020, we're like, when I saw 2020, I did not see this coming. And Elisha, and Naaman did not see what he saw coming. Now, if you're a general, my doctors that are here, if you're a general that's well-respected, everybody loves you, everybody cares about what you have to think, and you go to somebody's door, and they don't have the common courtesy of even answering the door themselves, and they own the house, how would you feel? Disrespected, mad, upset, frustrated, all of that stuff. Elisha did not even answer the door, but Elisha sent a messenger to say, go wash yourself in the Jordan ten time, or seven times, and your, your, your flesh will be healed. Let's see what Naaman says. Let's go to verse 11, Georgie. It says, but Naaman went away angry and thought to himself, I thought surely, I had thought that surely this man would come out to me and stand and call on the name of his Lord. And he thought, like, I was just going to wave his, his, mad, his, his wand around my, my skin diseases and my spots, and I was going to be healed. That's what he thought. That's what, when I came to this building, I thought that that's exactly what was going to happen. When I came into 2020, I thought that's exactly what was going to happen. But how many of you in your life did not expect to be in the position that you may have been in at one point in time in your life? Many of us, right? And in verse 12, check this out. It says that the servants say to Naaman this, the servants, right, are not Abana, far, far the rivers of Damascus, better than all the waters of Israel? Couldn't I just wash in them, uh, in them instead and be cleansed? So he turned away and went off in a rage because he was disrespected. Nobody's going to talk to me like that. I'm a, I'm, a, I'm a master. When I tell people to do something, they do it. When I say something, it goes. But check out, this is, what, this is his response to Elisha. Like, and he turns away and walks in a rage. And let's see what, I, what else happens in verse 13. I talked about the servants just now. But it says, Naaman's servants went to him and they say this, My father, if the prophet had told you to do some great thing, would you not have done it? How much more then when he tells you to wash and be cleansed? So they, they tell Naaman, you know, Naaman, with all due respect, high and, and mighty esteemed, uh, your majesty, if the prophet had told you to buy 10,000 Hershey's kisses and bring it and drop it on the front of Elisha's door, you would have done it. If the prophet had told you, Naaman, to buy 70 trampolines and bring 60 babies and just drop them on the trampolines and just see them bounce on the trampoline with guards, obviously, you know, you would do it. If, if he told you to buy 60 Lamborghinis, you would do it. But all he's asking you is go in the water and just wash yourself. All he said was just go and take a shower. <laughs> the instruction was easy. It wasn't a hard instruction. He just said go and wash yourself. But Naaman had a condition. He had a condition. It wasn't just leprosy. There was an internal condition that was greater than his external condition. And his internal condition was the P word called pr -pr -pr pride. I, went, I, was asked, I was about to ask the youth group uh, last night during Bible study. I almost said, uh, raise your hand if you don't have any pride at all. And I was waiting for somebody to raise their hand. And I was going to be like, you exactly proved my point. Right? I think that we all at one point or another, if we're going to be honest with ourselves, struggle with pride. Here's how I know. How many of you, and I don't mean to put all of us on the spot because I myself have made this, this error, have said, I don't have enough time to read my Bible Check this out. Who is the author of time? 
God is the creator of time. So when we tell the creator of time that I don't have time for the person who made time, that's pretty prideful. When I look at how Jesus forgave me of my sins, and then I look at my circumstance and somebody who wronged me and said, I can't forgive you today. Maybe I'll forgive you tomorrow. That's pr- 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 pride. It's procrastination. That is that. But procrastination is a form of pride. I'm putting something off because I have something that's more important. I have something to do that's more important than what I need to get done. See, Naaman, we're talking about external conditions. See, God wanted to heal Naaman. If you don't think that God wants to heal you of whatever infirmity that you may have externally or internally, that's not true. God is Jehovah Rapha. It's in his very nature. God the healer. It's in his very nature to heal the things that we struggle with. But first, before God wants to heal the things that are on the outside, remember, God doesn't look at the outside, but he looks at the inside. Before God can heal us of the things that we struggle with on the outside, God's like, let me do a work in your heart before I work on your body. Because Naaman struggled with something that was uh, temptations more, more than skin deep. He struggled with pride. He thought to himself, I'm, uh, excuse me, I got waters that are way better than your river over here in these parts. I got, I got uh, people who will shower me if I want them to. I got, I got all kinds of money. I, could just, I would just rather buy my blessing, right? Naaman tried to do this. He tried to put a condition on the way that God could bless him. God, I want you to bless me, but only um, at the rivers that I want. That's p- 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 pride. God, I want you to do this for me, but, but, but like you can't do it right now. God, I want you to fix my situation, but, but I got something to do first. Naaman had to be healed of his internal condition. See, God's more concerned about healing our internal conditions, the things that we struggle with in our heart, pride, greed, anger, hostility, hatred. He's more focused on fixing that than he is in fixing the outward problems. Uh, poverty, it's always going to exist. Strife between neighbors is always going to exist. But on the inside is how we look at it. That's what God's interested in. How can I help these people become more like me in all that I have called them to do? And so it says the Naaman went down. After hearing what they had said, it's just like, all right, whatever, y'all got me. I'm just going to give this a try. And I bet that Naaman went up to the water and was like, this water smells. It doesn't look good. Ah, this is unpleasant. I would much rather bathe in my own waters. But it says that he went, he went, what? What's the preposition that's used there? He went down. But Naaman's a man of pride. Naaman's a man that's well esteemed and well regarded by people. It's not in his nature to go down. Naaman has never kneeled to nobody. I heard heard football players say this all the time. I coach football, so I know. They, They say this, I fear God. Meaning like I'm not scared of anybody except for God. Well, well, yeah, but, but Naaman went down. And he humbled himself and went inside the water. Now, when I, when I picture it in my brain, my brain's colorful. So I'd like to think that when Naaman was going in the water, he's like, this is so whack. Walked in. And he walks out. And the spots are not clean. This is ridiculous. Comes back out. This is, comes back in. He's like, oh, my gosh. Because it doesn't say that as he was going, the, the spots were being cleansed. It doesn't say that at all. It says that he dipped himself, and then it happened. And so he goes in. But notice, he starts to, I feel like as he was going in, he started to, all right, maybe this will work. Maybe, I don't know, I just, I just want to keep going four times. Oh, maybe, maybe God will clear, clear me this time. And you can see, like, this eating away 
of the humility or the, the pride that he had in himself. And he went down and down and down and down until the point where he got down the seventh time. He had to get down seven times. And on the seventh time, it said that he was made like that of a young boy. And I love it because it's like he got down first and he came back up. It says in Second, First Peter chapter 4 that if you humble yourself under the mighty hand of God in due time, he'll lift you up. Right? If you stand up really tall, there's only one way for you to go and that's down. But if you start off down here, there's only one way to go but up. I coach offensive line, and my thing I always tell the guys is when you get, into your, when you get out of your stance, you want to you wanna start off low, and you come up. And it says that Naaman dipped himself down seven times, eked away at that pride, that stuff that was holding him back, that the status, the wealth, the money, all of that stuff, Naaman had to strip away. And then he received his healing. And the reason why I say that is because, like, I think that we all have a condition, externally, but more importantly, internally. It could be something that you struggle with yourself, trauma of your past, hatred that you feel towards somebody who wronged you, bitterness that you could be feeling in your heart, the, the, the not wanting to move forward and being stuck in where you are now. I don't know what, your pro- what it is that's your condition, but I'm here to tell you, That God wants to cleanse you of your condition today. God wants to cleanse you of your condition today. But the question is, are we willing to get down and humble ourselves under the mighty hand of God so that in due time, he will raise us up? Um, I have a video presentation that you can turn to after this of... Um, I think it's the next slide, Georgia. There was somebody that I know, my aunt, many of you guys know her, Auntie Kenna, who was diagnosed with cancer, I think in 2017, maybe 17. It's, I think it's the next slide. She was diagnosed with cancer in 2017. And uh, externally, things are bleak, right? Externally, things, death is, is pretty much certain at this point. And if many of us were in her position, give up on God. I'm done. I don't want to keep going. I can't keep fighting. This is pointless. Live like the writer of Ecclesiastes said in the beginning. All is vanity. It's all worthless. It's all meaningless. We're all going to die one of these days. Have that bleak outlook. That's the external. But I want you to see the internal condition that she had in the middle of her external condition. Can you play it for me? Hello, everyone. I was just inspired to sing this song to thank God for his faithfulness and his love for everyone, including myself, my little family. God loves everybody. We just need to come away to his presence in everything, everywhere, especially in our beings. We just need to recognize the presence of God. But he loves you all. He loves us all. So here's his eyes on the sparrow. Why should I feel discouraged? Why should the shadows come? Why should my heart be lonely? And long for heaven and home When Jesus is my portion A constant friend is he His eye is on the sparrow And I know he watches me. 
I sing because I'm happy. Yes, I sing because I'm free. Yes, I is on the sparrow, and I know he watches. Me. God bless you, everyone. In Jesus' name, amen. You know, how does someone get to the position where I'm, I'm literally close to dying? Externally, the doctor told me that there is nothing left for me. Everybody's written me off. This is the end. But on the inside, I say, his eyes on the sparrow. And if his eyes on that little sparrow, I know he's going to take care of me. Family, I don't know what condition you may be dealing with today. On the inside, insecurities that you may feel, hurt that you may have gone through. But I'm here to tell you that yes, you may have been hurt. You may be struggling. But I believe that God wants to heal the inside. You know, when Jesus died, he didn't die for your external body. He died for the inside. He came for the inside. He lived for the inside. He lived for the thing that's deeper than the skin. And he died to give you life on the inside. Whatever it is that you may be dealing with right now at home or those of you who are here today, I want you to know that God can give you freedom on the inside. But he wants us to get to the point where we're low enough so that he can pick us up and give us the continuation to keep going. You know, the portrait of Naaman going through the Jordan River is a portrait of what Jesus did for us. See, Jesus in John chapter 3 told Nicodemus, who was a Pharisee, that in order for you to receive the kingdom of heaven, you must first be born again. And when Naaman, check this out, when Naaman was going through the water and humbled himself and lowered himself, to receive that, con that, that conditional blessing of, of his external condition being cleansed. It says that he went down and washed himself seven times. And when he came up, check this out, his skin was like that of a baby being born again. And if you want to receive freedom, deliverance, breakthrough, everything that you've been looking for in your life that is not external, but the longings that you have in your heart on the inside, you must be born again. Born again. Going into the water, being cleansed. And Jesus is the representation of the lamb who went down and was washed so that we can be made right with God. Thank you, Auntie, for that reminder. That whatever happens on the outside, I'm going to be content because if his eyes on the sparrow, I know he's going to watch over me.